true murder is a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer. I would also play with you. Thank you to play with Sam. The Night Stalker, VTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. In September of 1990, in the Cleveland suburb of Shaker Heights, 16-year-old Lisa Pruitt, a poetry lover and member of a church youth group, was on her way to a midnight tryst with her boyfriend when she was viciously stabbed to death only 30 feet from the boy's home. The murder cast a palpable gloom over the upscale community and sparked accusations, theories, and rumors among Lisa's friends and peers. Together they wove a damning narrative that circled back to a likely suspect, weird high school outcast Kevin Young. Without a shred of evidence, the teen was arrested, charged, and tried for the crime. His eventual acquittal didn't squelch the anger and outrage among those who believed that Kevin got away with murder. With a fresh perspective and painstaking research called from police files, court records, transcripts, uncollected evidence, and new interviews, James Renner reconstructs the events leading up to and following that heartbreaking night. What emerges is a portrait of a community seething with dark undercurrents, its single-minded authorities protective status conscious parents, and the deeply peer-pressured teens within Lisa's circle. Who had the capacity for such unchecked violence? What monsters still lurk in the dark? After more than 30 years, questions like these continue to fester among the community of Shaker Heights, Ohio, still deeply scarred by wounds that remain hidden, unspoken, and unhealed. The book that we're featuring this evening, is Little Crazy Children, a true crime tragedy of lost innocence, with my special guest, investigative journalist and author, James Renner. Welcome back to the program, and thank you very much for this interview, James Renner. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be back. Thank you so much, and congratulations on this truly extraordinary book. Thank you very much. Let's get to discussing, of course, Shaker Heights, Ohio, you say to the east of Cleveland is a town, Shaker Heights, with its own utopia. Shaker Heights is a, it's a weird little community to, on the east side of Cleveland. It's affluent, it's, but it's located just past the, the ghetto, just past the rough part of Cleveland. You find this wonderful little neighborhood called Shaker Heights, and it's, it's unlike any other. It was actually planned and plotted out by a pair of eccentric brothers named the Van Swearigans about 100 years ago. And they were local businessmen. They actually built Terminal Tower, which gives Cleveland its iconic look. And they were looking to build a new community outside of Cleveland for the elite who could have their families out there. And at the time, the land was owned by the Shakers, the religious group, the Shakers, which are an interesting subset religion in that they believe in abstinence mm. completely. So you'll have these little communities of Shakers that pop up, but they don't last long, right? Sure. Because they, they don't reproduce. And so the Van Swergens saw that the Shakers were kind of on their way out, and they offered to buy that whole little community. And that's why it's called Shaker Heights. And it was kind of like, you know, what, what Walt Disney had planned for his utopias down in like near Disney World in Florida, a planned community that the, the streets don't, they, they kind of meander around these, these nice ovals. All the houses have really large lawns. It's just a, it's a beautiful little place, but it's because of that, it's, it's a little weird too. And, you know, they, the community prides themselves in integration. They, you know, even the sons and daughters of, of these elite families of, of lawyers and doctors and politicians, they would send their, at least in the 90s, when this story takes place, they would send their kids to the public school, which was, which was integrated. 
So, you know, they would give loans to African-American families to move into certain places of the town. And that was really kind of a tricky way of keeping the numbers of African-American families in check. So it looked like integration, but really it was a plan to make it not really as integrated as it could have been. So there's Shaker Heights. It's this people might remember the setting from that popular book that came out a few years ago, Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. She was actually a student at Shaker Heights High, who, and she was a few years younger than Lisa Pruitt. Lisa Pruitt, the young woman who was murdered, who this, this story centers around, and everything that came after it. She was 16 years old, and the day of her murder, she had just gotten her driver's license. She was very excited. She was madly in love at the time with a young man named Dan Dreifert. Dan was kind of a, a troubled kid. He was a talented musician. He already had a, it was playing with a band of his, playing local gigs, and had some issues and was uh, in a psychiatric ward for about a month and actually was released the day that Lisa was murdered. And they had been away for so long, they made plans for Lisa to sneak out of her house that night and ride her bike over to Dan's house. And that's that's how she ends up there. Let's talk about September 13th, 1990. You, you write that there's an officer, Edward Curtin, and he gets a call from Dan Dreifert. And uh, so what does the Dan Dreifert say when the police arrive, what's the story he has to tell? Yeah, so the, the police get a call about 1230. They get a number of calls, actually. Neighbors in houses around the corner of Lee and South Woodland, which is a major intersection in Shaker Heights. And that's Dan's family owns a mansion basically on that corner. A number of people call the police and say they heard a woman screaming. And the police respond. They, they also they responded first and don't see anything. And then they kind of go back to their patrols. And then Dan Dreifert calls them and says, hey, look, my girlfriend was supposed to come over and meet with me, but she never showed. And I think she might be the, the woman who was screaming. And so the officers go to Dan's house and he's standing outside. Dan is 16 at the time. He doesn't at this point doesn't want his parents to know about any of this. So he kind of meets the police outside and takes them over to where he said he found Lisa's bike. And it's propped up against the bushes just off the sidewalk. And the police say, okay, why don't you go back in, in the house and so we'll come get you. They do a sweep of the neighborhood. They walk around for a while. They get this. Actually, an important part of the story is they have a, another officer shows up with a canine unit. Right. This dog that's really good at, at, at sniffing out scents. And takes takes the dog over to the bike, picks up a scent, and takes the officers around the block to the road behind Lee, which is called Sedgwick, and then kind of loses the scent. And they come back through the backyard of the Dreifert's neighbors. And at the corner of their backyard, at the edge of Dreifert's property, they find Lisa's body. And she's just died. She's been stabbed. I think like 19, 20 times. And they find her half clothed. Her pants are down around one leg and her shirt has been pushed up. And that's basically when the story begins. Dan Dreifert says some, in retrospect, or at least at the time for police, some suspicious statements regarding that bike. Yeah. The first thing he tells them is, hey, my fingerprints are probably on this. Which at that point, he, as far as he's told police, he doesn't know what happened to Lisa. He tells them he, he believes she might have been abducted or, or taken. So it's a weird thing to say. You know, he's, he's aware that that bike might be part of a crime scene and he's concerned that his fingerprints might be on it. He tells them the fingerprints are on it because he moved the bike because he wasn't sure it was Lisa's at first. He also gives a couple different stories about whether or not his parents knew that Lisa was coming over. His, you know, he tells, dispatch one thing, he tells the police another. Eventually they wake up, his, uh, his father comes out and they talk to his parents as well. Eventually they all end up at the police station once Lisa's body is found. And Dan is interviewed that night, his father's interviewed the next morning, and the investigation begins in earnest the, the next day. 
Now, police go to Gary Pruitt, Lisa Pruitt's father. You write about that reaction and what Gary has to say and the family reaction. Yeah, it's it's very sad all around for the Pruitts. They had three children. Lisa's younger brother, I think it was a younger brother. She had a brother who died as a child. There was, I think, health complications in, in that instance. So they had already lost one kid. And Lisa was a very good kid. As far as I found, she was just, just a really smart, energetic, you know, just an empathetic young woman. And the police, of course, they once they found her body, they drove out to the Pruitts and woke up the parents and her father, Gary, came down and they said, hey, do you know where your daughter is? And he said, oh, she's upstairs sleeping. And they said, please go check. And he went upstairs and found that she was not there, that her bed was empty. And then they discovered that her bike was missing. And so then the police were pretty sure that that's, you know, the, the, the body they found was in fact Lisa at that time. And then she was identified shortly thereafter. And uh, it was just devastating for the Pruitts. Now, let's get back to Dan Dreifert and his father as well. You say they ended up at the station for questioning. Who was the detective in charge? The detective in charge uh, was a man named Thomas Gray. And he just happened to be the detective that got the case. I think it was his turn. He was the detective on duty at the time. However, it happened, it became his case, which in hindsight was unlucky. It was his first case of that magnitude. And he hadn't been a police officer for too long. And the reason he became a police officer, he told them, was because it paid better than being a line cook. Wow. You know, he had no lifelong aspiration to be a police officer or even a detective. He worked at Popeye's Chicken in in Louisiana for a while and worked restaurant jobs in Cleveland. So kind of a weird background. And he became his case and he he started investigating with another officer, Mm. another detective. And but he was really the main force behind it. Mm. And he he's the one that interviewed Dan Dreifert that night and got his statement on the on the record there. Now, in terms of cooperation, the father and the son luring up before this interview, were they cooperative? And what did Tom Gray elicit in terms of a statement from Dan Dryford? It really worked in their favor, both Dan Dryford and his dad. I think his dad's name's Robert. They were very cooperative with police and they, they, he, they allowed Dan to be questioned. Dan gave a very lengthy statement, and then his father did too, and then eventually his mother. So they were very cooperative with police, which went a long way with the whole thing. It's, I think it's what made Detective Gray feel that it wasn't Dan that was involved in this murder. So, you know, he he got a lot out of Dan that night. You know, he'd come to find out that Dan kept a lot from him, but he basically got a timeline of that day, you know, Dan talks about getting out of the hospital where his father had had him committed. His father worked at Cleveland Clinic and had his son committed to the same hospital where he worked. And he had been there for about a month. That day he got out around lunchtime, went to school, surprised Lisa. She was very happy to see him. Then he hung out with some friends. And then Lisa came over to his house. Her father brought her over. I think it was like 7 p.m. that night, sometime around there, to visit real quickly before her flute lesson. And she was excited because she had just gotten her driver's license that day. And so she she was only at the Dreifertz, I think, for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And, you know, they I think they kissed and, you know, got caught up. And and uh, that's basically when they made plans. She told him that she would sneak out and ride her bike over to his house about 1230. So then she leaves with her father and and goes home, has a nice dinner. And in fact, she does sneak out. Now, Dan then tells the police, oh, I forgot she was coming over, which anybody who's been a, a teenage boy knows how ridiculous that that sounds. You've right. been away from your girlfriend mm. for a month and you're telling me that you forgot that she's going to sneak out and meet up with you that night. It doesn't sure. quite work. And then he says he was in his room when he heard the screaming. He opened the window. The screaming continued. Then he uh, woke up. His his dad was already kind of awake because he heard the screams too. And his father sent him out to see what it was. And he says he went out, didn't see anything. So he came back in, told his dad, you know, he didn't see anything. 
And then he's like, oh, and that's when I remembered that she was coming over. So after his father went back to sleep, he snuck out of the house and he says that's when he found her bike and called the police. Now, tell us about Dan Dreifert. And he talks about all his friends that he had invited over to his home earlier in the evening and what they were, I guess, planning to do, but also that he had a friend named Tex Workman and Tex Workman had talked to a person named Kevin Young that night. Let's talk about Dan Dreifert's story about what went on that night at the at the coffee shop. Yeah, sure. So every time the police spoke with Dan, he would reveal a little bit more about that day. And because the first time he spoke with him, he didn't he wasn't complete about what happened that day. So like I said, he had been in the hospital for a month and Lisa wasn't the only one that was supposed to come over that night and sneak out of their house. He called a number of his friends and invited them over. And he had planned to have what's called a, a robo party back in the 90s. Kids who wanted to get high but couldn't get the illegal stuff would go to the corner store and buy powerful cough medicine like Robotussin. So that's why you, they called it robo. And if you drank more than like half a bottle of Robotussin with the um, with the the big ingredients in it, they um, it would make you trip for a little while. So. Right. That's what Dan was really into. So he has some friends. He actually had written to Lisa and asked her to pick up some Robitussin for him. So yeah, he invited at least three or four of his friends and then tells the police that each and every one of them called him later that night and said they weren't going to come over. So which strikes me as a little odd too. Uh, and one point of the day, this man, a young man, teenage boy comes over to Dan's house to visit with him. And this this man is called, uh, this guy's called Tex Workman. His, you know, they called him Tex. And Tex is dating at the time Dan's older sister, Debbie. Debbie, though, is away at college. She goes to, she was going to OU, uh, which is about three hours away from Shaker Heights. And the Tex comes over to visit with Dan. Dan says, hey, could you run out and get some cigarettes? You could keep the change or vice versa. Tex wanted some cigarettes and was going to bring back change for Dan. Any, in any event, Tex goes to get cigarettes. And he already knows Dan has told him that Lisa is sneaking out of the house to come visit him that night and says, hey, I've got some other people coming over. If you want to hang too, you're welcome to be at this party with us. Um, so Tex goes out to Shaker Square to pick up some cigarettes. And while he's there, and that's just a couple miles from Dan's house. So he takes Dan's bike, rides his bike over to Shaker Square. He also visits the coffee shop there. And the coffee shop's called Arabica. And he stops in and bumps into another mutual friend of theirs, a young man named Kevin Young. Kevin Young's a little bit older. He had just graduated high school and was starting his freshman year at Ohio State University. He was going to start that next Monday. So this is the Thursday before that. And so Tex hangs out with Kevin and says, hey, Kevin, you know, Lisa's sneaking out of her house and going to hook up with Dan tonight. And Kevin knew him both and was kind of mad at Dan at the time. So said some unsavory things and I don't know, called him a jerk or something. And so now Kevin has this knowledge, right? So from Tex, you know, it's that telephone game. More and more people are aware that Lisa's sneaking out of her house. So that becomes important because the day after the murder, a number of Dan's friends go to the police and say, it can't be our friend. He's such a good guy. And the police are like, well, who do you think could possibly do something like this? And everybody said, oh, it's got to be the weird kid in school, Kevin Young. You know, he wears black and listens to Metallica and plays D&D. And Kevin was a bit of a problem kid. You know, this, this all happened in 1990. I think if this were to happen today, pretty obvious to me that Kevin would have been on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum somewhere. Mm. He had a hard time relating to his peers. He had these loud outbursts in public and would cause these little scenes. So I think that's what was going on with him. I'm no psychiatrist, but my I do have a son who's on the spectrum. So I'm, I'm very aware of the way that you know people on the spectrum behave and act. So it just strikes me that that's, that's what it was. So in any event, the friends say, yeah, you got to look into Kevin Young. And then when they found out that Kevin had spoken to Tex and would have had knowledge that Lisa was sneaking out, they were like, oh, wow, this is, they, they thought that, that was 
really good circumstantial evidence. And at some point, Detective Gray and his colleagues became become convinced that it is Kevin Young, that it has to be Kevin Young. And they don't really look at any suspects after that. But to this day, there's no physical evidence that has ever linked Kevin to that crime scene or to Lisa. And in fact, all the circumstantial evidence they have basically rules Kevin Young out as a suspect. But that didn't keep him keep them from going after him. Kevin was eventually charged with Lisa's murder, indicted, and he went to trial in the summer of 1993. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for these messages. Now, you've jumped ahead to the trial, but we have to assess, as you do, as you write, how the police decided and how they underwent their breaking of Kevin Young. They had spoken to all the friends, including Dan Dreifert, but also the other friends and what they had to say. So they got supporting, in their mind, circumstantial evidence of things that would fit, that Kevin Young would fit for this in terms of a violent background and things that he had said that incriminated him and involved him in this murder. Some of the friends said that they had overheard him saying he was going to kill Dan and Lisa, that he was mad. That kind of goes back to when Dan started dating Lisa and he was jealous. I think jealous more of Lisa's time that she was spending with Dan because he he considered Dan a good friend. And, you know, there were these overheard conversations, Arabica, in which he shouted that he was going to kill Dan. I don't think he ever really said that. I think it was more something along the lines of I'm going to, you know, I'm going to beat him up or whatever. That never regardless, that never happened. Or, you know, there was never any sort of altercation between him and Dan Dreifert. And down the road, when more and more evidence came out, it appears that during his rants that were overheard about these threats, he wasn't talking about Dan and Lisa, but Dan and this other girl named Becca, who Dan had kind of also been seeing on the side and made out with this girl. And she was supposed to go to prom with Evan. And so there was some weirdness there. And it was likely he was talking about Dan and Becca and not Dan and Lisa. But anyways, he becomes a suspect for that and a number of other things that just went terribly wrong. For instance, at the time, Shaker Heights was hiring for prosecutors. They were looking for a new prosecutor. And they interviewed like 10 candidates. And one of these was a lawyer from Columbus And during his interview, he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, I see you you guys are going after Kevin Young. You know, I'm friends with his lawyer down in Columbus, and his lawyer told me that Kevin did it. And in that interview, everybody kind of freaks out because, you know, what he even if that were true, he's breaking attorney client privilege. People could be disbarred for that. But they send out the police, they do an investigation, they talk, They go down and talk to this lawyer that Kevin had, and he's like, well, what are you talking about? And he's like, I kind of know that guy in passing, but he's not a friend of mine, and I certainly wouldn't tell him anything like that, and it's not true anyways. And what the police said, even in their reports, the police that went down to Columbus and talked to him, they're, they're like, look, I think this guy's just making up a story so that he can get this job. But that really went a long way with Gray, I think. And he's like, well, if his lawyer is saying he did it, then he must really be guilty. So that just kind of that was another nail in the coffin for Kevin. So they do a couple of weird things. Shaker Heights eventually consults with a psych, a very famous psychologist out of the University of Syracuse, Syracuse University. Myron Murray is his name. And he's consulted with the FBI in a number of cases. He was the consultant for Waco. He says he's good at profiling these these type of killers. And so they consult with him. And Myron Murray gives them advice on how to break Kevin. And even says in this recorded conversation, like, look, you know, the boyfriend makes a pretty good suspect, too, don't you think? And the police are like, yeah, case could be made against the boyfriend. But right now we're looking at Kevin. and. The psychologist, Dr. Myron Murray, uh, he says, well, okay." he's like, even if it's not Kevin, here's how you get him to confess to it. And so what a crazy thing to say. But anyways, the police go down, the detectives go down and they interview Kevin Young. Detective Gray himself interviews Kevin Young in order to try to force him into confessing to this crime. 
and shows up at his dorm room one night. I think they show up at about 8 p.m. They take him to a local hotel and they've got a guy with a lie detector box, you know, lie detector machine there waiting. And Gray first interrogates Kevin. And this interrogation goes on for more than 24 hours. It's insane. And sometime in the middle of the night, like around two, three o'clock in the morning, they gave him his first lie detector test. And the guy that's operating the machine, also a police officer, says that he thinks he's being untruthful, which eventually I I consult with the leading polygraph people in the state of Ohio who tell me that the way he conducted the test was inadmissible anyways. He, he did it wrong. So you've got this bad test going on. And so they give him like, I think they actually give him like three different tests over the, those 24 hours and tell him that he's being untruthful. But at no point does Kevin Young confess to the crime. He doesn't break, although he, he is essentially driven kind of crazy and ends up in the mental hospital a day later because of this interrogation. It's very interesting and we never really get an explanation, but Kevin Young's father isn't an attorney, not a criminal defense attorney, but he's a he's an established attorney. And you really chronicle is the underhanded techniques of Detective Gray and the other detectives that were all formed, were all grouped together to be able to successfully try to get a confession was their main goal. Now, the thing is, is that these unhanded techniques that you chronicle, it's amazing all of the things that they violated in that. They asked him who they thought had killed Lisa Pruitt. What did he have to say in that regard? And why was Tex Workman sort of not interesting to both defense and prosecution in this case? It's interesting, right? Because Tex is certainly a suspect. He knew Lisa was coming over and he doesn't really have an alibi. He says that he left Dan's house at about 1130 and then walked to get a take a bus back to his house. But then the bus doesn't he says the bus doesn't show up for 45 minutes and he doesn't get home until well after the time of the murder. But Tex is a wild card in this whole thing. And both the prosecutors and the defense didn't really want to bring him in because it really complicates the whole thing a little bit, especially for a jury. And one of the things the defense attorney told me, the defense attorney, he got a really great defense attorney, a guy named Mark Devan, who essentially saved him, at least for a couple decades. And Devan told me, he's like, look, our strategy was to show that Kevin was not the best suspect. Dan Dreifert was a much better suspect than he was. So you can't just throw things at the wall for the jury. We couldn't give them a number of suspects. We had to concentrate on one. And Dan was a better suspect than Tex. So Tex has always been kind of a wild card in this whole thing. What's interesting to me is, yes, Kevin Young's father was an attorney with a very prestigious law firm in Cleveland. But again, we're talking Shaker Heights. You, you can't throw a rock in, in Shaker Heights without hitting a, an attorney or a doctor or a politician of some sort. So all these kids, their parents were lawyers or something. But his father worked at this law firm. And at some point in time, and mind you, if the father has one inkling that his son really could have done this, he never would have, as a lawyer, never would have let him speak to police. And he, he never kept Kevin from talking to the police because he knew Kevin couldn't do it because Kevin was playing video games with his father until 1 a.m. the night of the murder. But at some point in time, the whole thing becomes so crazy. The father's like, look, just charge him so that we can get this to court where, you know, where things are logical again, you know, court has a procedure. It's logical. Everything you guys are doing is illogical and insane. So just charge him already, which, you know, I, I think goes a long way to showing that the father was never, never for one second did he think that Evan could have done this. Now, what's I think most important in this this confession that he tried to get was that the, the statements that Detective Gray made to Kevin Young near the end of this statement without getting a confession, and he was frustrated about that. What was this implicit threat that he made to Kevin Young? And obviously, that would have been an important threat to, to a young man. Yeah, the detective tells Kevin, look, you have to confess to this so that you, because we're going to charge you, but if you cooperate with us, we're not going to put you to death because in the state of Ohio, there's the death penalty. And I don't know that this necessarily would have applied, but Kevin didn't know that. And the, the detective wanted him to know that 
if he didn't cooperate with them, if he didn't confess to this, he'd still get arrested, still be charged, but now he'd face the death penalty. So he's got that hanging over his head. And he's like, by the way, you can't you can't stay at at college because this is going to be on your mind. We're going to come after you anyways. And you can't go home because everybody back in Shaker Heights already knows you did it. So he just ruined, I mean, just broke this kid's mind. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second to hear from our sponsor. Ritual knows that it's impossible to get all the nutrients your body needs just from your diet. Ritual has created a multivitamin that can supply your body with all the nutrients it needs that are missing from your diet. My wife Lisa and I started to take Ritual just based on the research they'd done to create their multivitamin in the first place. It's been a few years now. We both appreciate the monthly delivery, and we both continue to rely on Ritual Multivitamin every day. With nine key nutrients in two capsules per day, their unique bed let in oil is even patented. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is one of the few women's multis that's USP verified, meaning what's on the label is what's in the formula. It's also soy free gluten-free, vegan-friendly, and formulated without GMOs. Instead of striving for perfect health, aim for supporting foundational health. Great news, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash murder to start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Now, you talked about the effect of this 24-hour ordeal for this young man with these threats to his livelihood and and trying to tell him that no matter what he said, that he was guilty of killing Lisa Pruitt. So what happens after in terms of hospitalization? So Kevin is admitted into a mental hospital, a psychiatric ward in Cleveland. I think it was Laurel Wood at the time, one of the big ones up here. and. And I think he stays there for, again, at least a month. And the local media make a big deal about that. The police tell everybody that his parents are hiding him in a psychiatric unit, that he, you know, that he's not crazy, that he doesn't need to be there. But that's their way of keeping him away from being interviewed by police. So while he's there, he, you know, meets with his father. And and that's when he meets the, the lawyer, Mark Devan. And It looks for a moment like the police are going to charge him, but they don't because they don't have the evidence. They do serve warrants on his home. They find some writing that he's done. You know, one seemed to be a possible suicide note, and he had attempted suicide in the past. And there were some very alarming things he had written about his mother and just he was an angry kid, but nothing that connected him to to Lisa in any way. They collected blood and hair samples from him. None of that matched to what they had. The case kind of went cold for a couple of years. And then a woman who was at that psychiatric unit with Kevin that month came forward and said, oh, Kevin confessed to me that he did murder Lisa. And she was interviewed by a local TV station. And then that's how they were able to finally get an indictment against Kevin and charge him with the murder. Along the way, police have press conferences and press releases that seem irresponsible in retrospect. Can you tell us about those? Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, again, I don't think it's something that could happen today, but you know, nothing like this had been tried, at least not in Northeast Ohio back then. Here's what they did. The, the, the police and prosecutors held a press conference at one point and said, hey, look, we know who did it. Kevin Young killed Lisa Pruitt, but the prosecutor's saying, we don't have enough evidence to assure that we'll win in court. So we just want you to know that Kevin killed Lisa. And it was so basically they've convicted him in the court of public opinion without having without allowing him a fair trial. Uh, I mean, it was just it was nutty. And that's when that kind of fell apart and because they got called out by a couple of decent journalists in town that were like, this is not how we do things in the United States. This is not this is not kosher. This is not fair. Mark Devan has got is an illustrious, high-profile lawyer with a um, incredible past. But Mark Devan, when he looked at the transcripts overall, what was his uh, what was his conclusion, and what was his attitude about this, the press, and the 
the police's behavior. You know, Devan said something interesting to me. You know, he actually hoped that Kevin was guilty. And it really upset him after he met Kevin and looked at the records and saw everything laid out when he realized that Kevin was innocent. He said, that's the worst thing for a lawyer because it's then your responsibility to save them. And if they go to prison, it's because you failed. So that was really alarming to him to know that Kevin was innocent here. So he was very passionate about, about it. He fought against the police and prosecutors trying to withhold, you know, trying to keep this indictment from happening. And then when it did, he hired his own investigators because he realized that it was up to him to find the real killer if they could as a way to save Kevin. And they got, I think his investigator got really close to who I think did it. He was like one interview away. One of the things his investigation kicked up that is becomes very important is that in the weeks leading up to Lisa's murder, there were a number of homes on Lee and Sedgwick that rode the runs parallel behind it that were broken into. There was a prowler in the neighborhood that was breaking into houses, not really stealing money, but stealing like trinkets and things, forcing his way through a skylight, cutting through screens to get in. And eventually I found out who that person was. And I do believe that person was responsible for Lisa's murder. This private eye Sheridan also uncovered spoke to another person at the coffee shop, Stefan Ravello, another worker there. Mm -hmm. And he told them something very, very interesting about the conversation that supposedly yeah. Tex and Kevin Young had, but also that there was other people present that night. Exactly right. That's the big part that Sheridan got, was not not able to follow through all the way. So the whole reason that the police at first looked at Kevin Young was that Kevin was aware that Lisa was sneaking out, right? Because he met up with Tex at Arabica at that coffee shop and Tex told Kevin that Lisa was coming over. It turns out there, were, there was one other young man in that coffee shop at the time who was near enough to overhear that conversation. And that young man's name was David Brannigan. And David Brannigan is very interesting. You know, so I had kind of eventually found that out that, okay, David Brannigan was there too, just like Kevin Young. He would have known Lisa was sneaking out. Let's look into David a little bit. And so I started reaching out to David's, uh, he had a girlfriend at the time who was his alibi. And she's like, look, they told me I was his alibi, but he definitely could have left my house in enough time to get to Lisa and intercept her. And in fact, David Brannigan lived on Sedgwick, the road behind Lee. So he, he would have passed it on the way home. In fact, he goes to police the day after the murder and says, you know, I bumped into a, a black man at the bus stop who mentioned Lisa's murder. I bet it was him. You should look into this guy. And if you know anything about Shaker Heights, you point the finger at a, at a black man, you get the police's attention pretty quickly. When the police followed up, they realized that Brannigan essentially places himself at the scene of the murder at around the time it happens because he said he saw the police with the canine unit looking around the neighborhood. And that's very important to me because that says that, yes, he was there. He knew about the canine unit, but the police didn't see him. So he's somewhere in hiding watching this. So he's right there when everything's going down. He says he went home then, his mom was awake and talked to his mom for a little while and then took a shower and went to bed. When the police followed up on that, they found out, oh, no, mom wasn't really awake. She was asleep when he got home. So he has no alibi. He took a shower that night. He collected knives. He had a collection of knives, like the type that could have been used to, to stab Lisa. And they never did find the murder weapon. They never did find that. So what really brought it home to me was I tracked him down and found out that he had died. He had died in 2017. He had essentially drank himself to death. But he, he was living with a woman and he had a daughter with her. So it was basically a common law wife. He had been living with her for like seven or eight years. So I went to her thinking that she would just slammed the door in my face. She invited me in. We got to talking. And eventually I asked her the question point blank. I said, do you think Dan killed Lisa Pruitt? And she thought for a second, she said, let me tell you a story. She said when Dan was in preschool, a boy pushed him down on the playground and he didn't react. He didn't hit the kid or anything. He didn't do anything. 
But then at lunch, he made a point to sit next to this kid. And when the kid wasn't watching, when the kid wasn't looking, he poured Comet bleach into the powder into the kid's sandwich. Wow. And the kid almost died. So do I think, do I think Brannigan, David Brannigan, do I think, do you think he killed Lisa? Yeah. You said I wouldn't doubt it. Let's get back to the saving of Kevin Young and then the demise of Kevin Young. You say that the van launched a brave and very, very talented defense of Kevin Young. And some of the highlights were breaking those witnesses that apparently he had confessed to while he was at the psychiatric hospital. Tell us just a little bit about what really broke that trial, what really made it a success for Kevin Young. Well, the the prosecution put up witness after witness. You know, a lot of these were local kids in the neighborhood who had these stories about Kevin Young threatening Dan and Lisa at first. And uh, Devan showed that, well, you know, they'd get on stand and, and they'd say, I heard Kevin Young threaten Dan Dreifert, like, uh, you know, Goody Proctor was dancing with the devil type of stuff. And, and uh, Devan would basically, he's like, did you really, did you really hear that? And they're like, well, I didn't hear it, but somebody told me about it. So a lot of that became hearsay. And then, oh, well, I don't know that he was really talking about Lisa. So one by one, you know, they were either lying or exaggerating their stories. And then it gets to the so-called confession, this woman who was a patient at the mental hospital, Kevin was staying, who said that he confessed to her one night that he killed Lisa. And turns out that like a moment before the so-called confession, this woman has a, a hallucination about her father being a POW in World War II or Korea somewhere and was being tortured. And so she's screaming and she goes out to the break room after this this hallucination. And that's when Kevin Young comes up and confesses. But then she doesn't go to the police or tell the staff or anything. She doesn't do anything with it. So a couple of years later, when she sees a local journalist covering the the death of Lisa Pruitt, and she calls him and arranges for this interview. And the, her first call is to this TV news reporter, not the police. And then she says, oh, I, you know, but I know this is true because I wrote it down in my diary. And so Devan brings up the diary. And weirdly, the page that mentions this confession doesn't match up with the page. It's not the same type of paper as the rest of the journal. It looks like it's been, it's been written in past tense, like it was written long after the event and placed in the book. And so it all just kind of falls apart on the stand. Anyway, like, how in the world would you consider a witness's statement as at all if it's coming from a patient in a mental hospital? It's just the whole thing's crazy. This uses an opportunity to stop for a second for these messages. You say this trial was, uh, it was very, very interesting, and you chronicled the whole thing and all of the, again, the friends of Lisa and Dan Dreyford and, and the neighborhood were, were witnesses, but also people that lived behind the Dreyford mansion, the residents, and, and also that the police didn't bother to have any physical evidence at this trial almost whatsoever. And so it was not a hard verdict for the jury uh, to give him a not guilty, uh, and, and he was acquitted of the crime. After this long, very, very public trial, Kevin Young is, is found not guilty. He's acquitted. So great. He's got his life back, he thinks. And then the next day, the plain dealer, the biggest paper in the region at, at the time, I think there were like a, a million people that were reading it on a, on a daily basis or something, mm-hmm. comes out with an article that says, well, if the jury had heard everything that wasn't allowed in court, they would have found him guilty of the murder. So it's like yeah. he thinks his life is saved. And then the very next day, the local paper just completely ruins it. And He's so distraught, he drives out and climbs onto a bridge over a very busy highway in Cleveland, about to commit suicide. A police officer happens to be driving by, sees it, stops the car, gets out, and is able to talk Kevin down. And so, again, he ends up in the mental hospital for a little while. Uh, but, but who wouldn't after that? You write about eventually speaking with Kevin Young briefly. Tell us about that encounter. I met Kevin Young once when I was a reporter for the weekly paper, the Village Voice paper out of Cleveland about 15 years ago or so. I had written, I was writing a piece on Lisa Pruitt and I wanted to talk to him. I ended up talking to him for a little bit. And the thing he was most upset about was he had moved on with his life and was trying to, he was running a, he was, 
just such a brilliant mind, but he ended up the best he could do was run this this business where he painted houses and made a eked out a living that way. And he said the thing that upset him the most is was the internet, you know, and the internet wasn't really a thing during his trial in 93, but into the late 90s, he couldn't get a date. He'd have a date with a woman and go really well. And then she'd go home and Google his name and all the stuff with Lisa Pruitt would come up. And then she'd say, I just can't do this. I, you know, it's, I can't do it. So it just destroyed this, this guy's life. And you could tell the pain he was in, you know, when I spoke to him, he was very, very upset. Tell us what happens eventually with Kevin Young. Just like a number of people in this story, along with Tex Workman, you know, he has issues with alcohol. Kevin ends up also essentially drinking himself to death. He is found dead in his apartment in 2017. And, you know, the autopsy reveals the cirrhosis of the liver, along with other other things. He had gotten caught up in crack cocaine as well. You know, just everything he could do to alleviate this uh, stress that he was going through. And so, yeah, he he passed away in, in 2017 before I, I started writing this book in 2020. Tell us about the circumstances in which you began to write this book. And before we talk about David Brannigan and his connection to a crime you describe from 1985, which was occurred eight houses away from the Dreyford mansion in 1985. And David Brannigan was a witness in that case. So I knew at some point I wanted to write a book about this. So slowly over the years, I had amassed, I, I put up public records requests until I got pretty much all the documents from the prosecutor's office in the city and the trial transcripts. And eventually I met with Devan, Kevin's lawyer. So I amassed all these documents and then COVID hit and suddenly I, I had nothing else to do. And I was, I was stuck at home. So I, I said, well, if I'm going to write about this, it's probably got to be now. Right. So I opened up those boxes. My intention going into it was to exonerate Kevin Young in the court of public opinion and to show that the boyfriend was the most likely suspect. And I got a couple of weeks into research when I started uncovering the stuff with David Brand again and realized that, wait, there was another young man at the scene of the crime that night that the police, the prosecutors knew about, but kind of kept quiet. And he's you know, once I started looking into his background, all this other stuff came out. There's this other, there was a double homicide that occurred five years before Lisa's murder. And it, it happened eight doors north of the Dreyfurt's residence. So same block, there was an older couple that was stabbed to death in their home one night early. It was like around, it was like a nine, nine, nine thirty PM on a Friday evening. And so I said, well, I better look at those records. And I had been avoiding it because there's a man sitting in prison for those murders, a guy named Donnie Soki, who had been convicted of it. So I'm like, well, those are solved. You know, what's the point of looking into it? But at some point, it became undeniable that there, there was some sort of connection going on here. So I pulled the records and lo and behold, the only witness to the murder or the only witness for the police was a young man named David Brannigan. David lived in a house directly behind or catacorner behind the Porter residence. Dorothy and Philip Porter were the victims. And Brannigan admits to breaking into the property next door to the Porters the night of the murder. Brannigan eventually, wow. I, I come to find out, was the young man who was breaking into homes on that block. So he, he said he broke into the property next door with a couple buddies to set off fireworks. And then they saw this, again, very similar story said he saw a black man run out of the back door of the porter's house at the time of the murder and chase them away. And, you know, they ran back home. And that story doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons. One, the door was locked from the inside uh, when the police discovered the porter's bodies. So the killer could not have gone out the back door. The point of entry for porter's killers was a small window in the kitchen that, uh, you know, somebody had cut through the screen and entered the, the window like was Brannigan's MO. And it appeared to be a burglary interrupted that Dorothy Porter likely heard something, came into the kitchen, saw the killer, and that's when he overpowered her and killed her. He stabs her and then strangles her with the cord of an iron in the basement. And certainly Brannigan has motive for that because if he's breaking into a house and gets caught, you know, Dorothy's going to recognize him as as the neighbor kid. So why is there a guy sitting in prison for this? That's kind of a longer story, but I'll make it real short. Donnie Soki had been in 
prison for theft and his mother was dying of cancer. And he concocted this story, said he was involved in the Porter's murders because he thought that he could arrange a deal with the prosecutors to get him out of prison uh, by confessing to this other crime. And unfortunately, he talked himself into a much bigger sentence, you know, like, you know, I think eventually he ended up getting 888 years. But his story is so-called confession to police, and he since recanted this confession. It's just ridiculous on the surface because he said he had a he and his father decided to kill the porters because Philip was once the an editor at the Plain Dealer and written terrible things about the Hell's Angels biker gang. And his dad dad was in the gang and was upset about that, as if that's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they said they had a getaway driver who parked on Lee Road for half an hour while they went in and did the murder. Well, that's just if you're from Shaker Heights, you know that's not can't possibly be true. Because there is no parking on Lee Road to this day. It's a very mm-hmm. busy, it, it's a throughway between to get to Cleveland. So it's always busy. And if you're parking in this no parking area on a very busy street, you're going to get noticed by police within like five minutes. So it's just, just a made up story. So, you know, I come to believe that David Brannigan is not only responsible for Lisa Pruitt's murder, but the double homicide of Dorothy and Philip Porter as well. Regarding the title of this book, The Little Crazy Children, you write at the end of this book, you know who killed Kevin. Yeah, it's the little crazy children of of Shaker Heights did. You know, they they ruined his life because they thought they were righteous and they they thought they could bend the truth because it had to be Kevin in order to honor their their friends. And you know, it uh, destroyed the kid's life. And, and so Kevin did, you know, he self-medicated and drank to feel good. And eventually that killed his, his body. Let's talk about uh, just a little bit about spring 2019 in the Porch Line Project and your book, True Crime Addict, came out in 2016. But tell us about this nonprofit, the Porch Light Project. Yeah. So yeah, I became frustrated at some point that I was writing about all these cold cases and not being able to solve them with books. So I formed a nonprofit called the Porchlight Project, and we raise money for new DNA testing and genetic genealogy for cold cases in Ohio, not just homicides, but also John and Jane Doe cases. And we got really lucky out of out of the gate. Our first case was the 1987 homicide of Barbara Blatnick, teenage girl who was abducted from. Garfield Heights, and whose body was found near Blossom Music Center in Cuyahoga Falls. And I reached out to the police in Cuyahoga Falls and said, hey, I think the case might be solvable with genetic genealogy, and we're really, you know, I'm willing to pay for the whole thing. So he said, all right, let's give it a try. And eventually got a profile from underneath Barbara's fingernails, and genetic genealogists in California took a look at it and were able to trace profile of the killer to a family, to three brothers in Cleveland, the Zastonic brothers. And then it seemed to be one particular brother who was most likely a guy named James Zastonic. And uh, the police pulled some fresh DNA from his trash and compared it with the original profile. And sure enough, it was a match. And so he was arrested in May of 2020 when we were still in lockdown here and was going to trial. He ended up dying of cancer before they got to trial, though. But at least the family had some closure to that, as much closure as possible with these things. Yes. And, uh, you know, since then, we've worked about five other cases. We've got, I think, four or five in the works and keep pretty busy with the Porchlight Project stuff. Absolutely. Great work. Uh, Kudos to you for that. Thank you. And your organization. Thanks. I want to thank you very much for coming on and talking about Little Crazy Children, a true crime tragedy of lost innocence. For those people that might want to take a look uh, more about this, uh, can you tell us about a website, social media, and your podcast? Yeah, sure. Best place for information about any of this is jamesrenner.com. It has links to everything else I do and the stories I cover. And yes, I do have two podcasts. One is called The Philosophy of Crime. It's kind of like the cosmos of true crime, I like to call it. It looks at the big questions of true crime, like why are we so obsessed with it? And you know, does profiling really work? It goes to classical philosophy for answers. I do one season of that podcast every year, six episodes every year. But I also have a weekly podcast called True Crime This Week that wraps up all the big stories in true crime that you might have missed. And that comes out every Friday morning. Well, thank you very much. Little Crazy Children, a true crime tragedy of lost innocence.
Thank you so much for this interview and you have a great evening. James Renner. Thanks so much, Dan. It's always a pleasure. Thank you.